Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm Brad Jolliffe, director of the McDonald Center for the Space Sciences, and it's my privilege to welcome you all to the Robert M. Walker Distinguished Lecture Series. This is the public lecture, and we're so glad that you could all be here. So I see faculty and students and friends of the McDonald Center for the Space Sciences and just friends from St. Louis who are interested in space science. Welcome to all of you. It's so good to see you all here. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight our distinguished lecturer, Dr. Manakshi Wadwa from Arizona State University, where she is professor and director of the School of Earth and Space Exploration there. Um, and they have absolutely a fantastic program, one of the le leading programs really in the country. And we like to think we have a good program here, but they're about four or five times bigger than we are. So um, just a little bit about uh, Professor Wadwa. She actually earned her PhD degree here at Washington University some years back. She uh, left here and went on to a postdoc at UC San Diego working in the Scripps Institute. She was then the curator of meteorites at the Field Museum in Chicago, where she really started doing some great work on meteorites. Actually, she started as a PhD student here, working on Mars meteorites, in fact, in addition to other meteorites. Then she went on to Arizona State University, where she became the curator of the a very excellent meteorite museum at ASU. It's one of the best in the country, probably the best in the world. And, um, and, and teaching there. And in 2019, she was appointed director of the School of Earth and Space Exploration. So uh, she's very accomplished. She has uh, more awards than, than I can remember to tell you about, but I'll, I'll just mention a few things. She is uh, an elected fellow of a number of societies, the Meteoritical Society, the Geochemical Society, the American Geophysical Union, uh, the European Geochemical union and, and several other unions. She's been the president of the Meteoritical Society. Uh, so she's very, very accomplished in her studies of meteorites. And in fact, um, she won the, the J. Lawrence Smith uh, Award a few years ago as the highest medal that you can get for meteorite studies from the National Academy of Sciences. And just this past year, she was elected to the National Academy of Sciences so she's very, uh, very accomplished, and we're very pleased to have her back giving this lecture. Now, it's a special um, event for us in that Robert M. Walker, who was the founding director of the McDonald Center for the Space Sciences, was here at a time when Professor Wadwa, as a graduate student, was working under uh, Professor Gillen Crozaz as her uh, uh, advisor. And of course, uh, Glenn and uh, Bob were married and they um, together, I think, would be very, very pleased and proud that um, uh, Professor Wadwa was back giving this lecture. Um, and Glenn, who is, who is in Belgium now, is unable to be here in attendance, but I know that she will be watching a recording of this lecture and she will be very, very pleased. And again, uh, Professor Wadwa has, has pursued the kind of science that that Bob Walker initially began at Washington University, and that is asking big questions and then saying, how can we go about solving those big questions and then doing the careful analytical work that is needed to do that. And so among her many accolades, she has, the, she has determined the age of the oldest object formed in the solar system from its very beginning, which is 4.568 billion years old. And that's no mean feat. Everybody's trying to break that record, and I think it'll be a while. She has since branched out and become part of the Mars Science Laboratory team and working with the rovers on Mars and her expertise with the Martian meteorites. She has been selected to be the lead scientist for the Mars Sample Return Program, and that's what we're going to hear about tonight. So this is something that will happen, we hope, in the, in the fairly near future and she's gonna tell us all about that program. So Minnie, without any further ado, why don't you take over? Please help me welcome Professor Wadwa to the lecture. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you so much, Brad, for the incredibly kind introduction. Um, it's a real honor and it's a real privilege to be back here. This is you know, very much a homecoming for me. I think this is um, 
probably my first visit back to Washington University in 20, almost 20 years. And so it's incredible, you know, the, obviously uh, the department is doing fantastically. The McDonald Center seems to be doing great. And I'm, it's just been such a pleasure to meet uh, all the students, faculty here. Um, I was incredibly fortunate as, as Brad mentioned to be here at a time when Bob Walker was the director of the McDonald Center. And, uh, you know, I was incredibly fortunate to have known him as these, this amazing, mentor, teacher, uh, scientist, and he's always gonna be an incredible inspiration to me um, in, in all that I do. And so um, just, just such an honor to be back here to give this uh, Robert M. Walker public lecture. So as Brad mentioned, um, what I'm gonna be telling you about today is the Mars Sample Return Project, which uh, as he mentioned, I'm the science lead for that. Uh, but this is something that, you know, I've dreamed about for as long as I can remember studying, I guess, to be a scientist studying these planetary materials, right? I mean, ever since I was a graduate student and when I was studying these Mars meteorites, I, I thought about you know, how wonderful it would be to actually be this geologist on Mar Mars, vicariously a geologist on Mars, pick the, the absolute perfect samples to bring back to a laboratory and, and do the kinds of analyses that I'm doing in my laboratory now with meteorites and other types of samples. And so it's been a, a, a dream of mine for about three decades at this point. And this is finally, a, you know, Mars sample return has always been, always been on the horizon 10 years into the future. And it's still, it's still about 10 years into the future. It is, <laughs> so I will say that, but it's more real than it's ever been. And I'll tell you, you know why at this point, because there are things that are starting to happen. There's already an investment in terms of uh, some of the planning. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the planning. It's actually already underway. If you've been following the Perseverance rover, it's collecting those samples currently that will ultimately make it back here to earth. And so I'll t again, tell you a little bit more detail about that as we go along in this talk. So um, why Mars sample return? This is gonna be a historic endeavor. I mean, humanity has been fascinated by Mars for eons ever since, of course, I mean, you know, you may have heard of the Viking landers and, you know, with the dawn of the space age, of course, we've been able to actually start exploring Mars with spacecraft. And there's been over many decades, a huge investment that NASA has made in terms of orbiters, landers, rovers, increasingly sophisticated, spacecraft that have gone there to study Mars, to understand its geology, uh, to follow the water, the history of water on that planet. Because the very first spacecraft actually that flew by it, they saw a world that really looked pretty desolate. It was cratered, there was really not much there. But as we went closer and looked at it, we saw these features that looked like maybe there was maybe flowing water on the surface sometime in the past. And then we went and explored even more deeply. And now I think, you know, the understanding that we have of Mars as a planet, it's that it was not always as cold and dry as it is today. At some time in the past, it might have been very much warmer, may have been much wetter. There might have been standing bodies of water even. Um, and it could have been very, in many ways, Earth-like. And what we've learned about Mars up to this point from the exploration that we've done so far, the robotic exploration that we've done is that more than 50% of Mars's surface dates back to older than 3 billion years ago. And that's around the time, older than 3 billion years, that's around the time when we think that Mars had uh, a much different climate and, and may have been possibly a habitable world, may have been the place that could have harbored life and that's the kind of place that we want to go to, explore a place that could have been the cradle where life originated, possibly. That's the kind of place that we think maybe, you know, may have given a, a, a rise to life on Earth as well. But, you know, the history of ancient Mars rocks, I mean, I mean, ancient Earth rocks, of course, there's only, I think, less than 1% of Earth's surface that dates back to older than something like 3 billion years. And in fact, if you start to think about the most ancient materials on the Earth, these are these tiny little, you know, 
micron size, meaning, you know, a hundredth of a width of a human hair, that size, grains of zircon that date back to maybe, you know, 3.9 or 4 billion years or something older than that. There's actually some, some more ancient 4 point something billion year old fragments, but that's all we have. That's all we have. And so here we have a planet that has half the surface is older than 3 billion years, and we can go explore it and learn something about how life may have actually originated, try to understand the geologic context of where and how life might have originated. And that, that way we can actually try to understand something more about how life might, might have originated here on Earth. And so that's why we want to go back and study these Mars rocks that uh, are currently being collected by a rover called Mars Perseverance, Mars 2020 Perseverance rover. And we want to bring those samples back here on Earth, study them with the best capabilities that we have here in laboratories on Earth, hopefully in laboratories like mine <laughs> as well. And, and, and people that are in the audience here today, I know a number of the faculty members here at Washington University have these fantastic laboratories uh, where it would be great to analyze some of these materials and understand something about the geologic history and the possibility, um, the astrobiological potential of Mars, try to understand what kinds of habitable environments existed there, whether there was ever ancient life. And this is the nearest term opportunity that we have to actually find the existence of, of, of life elsewhere, to answer that really fundamental question that we have as human beings, are we alone in the universe? That's, this is our nearest term opportunity to do that. And so that's the rationale for wanting to actually bring back these samples. The, again, the science, the big science goals for bringing back samples from Mars is to understand the geologic context in which life may have originated. So, I mean, it's not just to go there and find evidence of ancient life. That, I mean, by, its, by itself, that would be not so meaningful. It's to understand the geologic context of a rocky world, a habitable world that may have given rise to life, and that may make us understand better how that might have happened on our own planet. And so we, all, we want to understand, you know, why is it that, uh, and why and how the climate evolved on Mars? We think that it was warmer, wetter, a uh, very different environment in um, early in, you know, it's in, in its ancient history, four and a half, four billion years ago. But now it's clearly, it's a much thinner atmosphere, much colder place, you know, it's a, it's not, a very hospitable place at this point. And so what actually happened? How did that climate evolve? Um, we wanna understand that. Uh, and then certainly of course, the potential for the development of life in that context and uh, understanding something about how that happened here on the earth. So the value, you know, what, what, is, what is the value of Mars sample return then in the bigger picture? There's actually, um, the, Brad mentioned the National Academies of Science, and that's you know the scientific body that actually provides advice to the US government in terms of the priorities that are set, the national priorities that are set in terms of science and what we, what we wanna be doing. And the planetary science community uh, every decade gets together and decides, you know, what are the pri science priorities for planetary exploration, space exploration? And I know there's a number of uh, folks here that, you know, some of the planetary scientists here who contributed to that decadal survey, the National Academy's decadal survey. And the last two of these decadal surveys in planetary science have prioritized Mars sample return as the highest priority for a large scale NASA mission. So that's, it's, a, it's been a priority of the community for a long time. Um, and then this latest decadal survey that was only completed this past year, it basically said that Mars sample return is the highest scientific priority for NASA's robotic exploration efforts in this decade. And we should be, we should be prioritizing it as part of our efforts to, to bring back the samples for exactly the kinds of science reasons that are already mentioned. It has very you know, high significance for, from a national perspective, from a global perspective. It actually represents one of the more significant uh, collaborations between NASA and ESA. So it's not, it's not being done alone by NASA. This is of a scale that is impossible really to do just you know, by itself, by a single agency. And so ESA is quite heavily involved uh, in this uh, effort. 
And so this is a, a really um, significant collaboration between you know, two of the most significant space agencies in the world. And it'll pave the way for humans to explore Mars. So the, whatever we learn from bringing back these samples from Mars, we will learn something about uh, potentially, you know, some of the hazards that might exist in terms of the, the dust that's on Mars, uh, the kinds of composition uh, that's represented by that dust and, you know, whether that could be hazardous as well. And so, you know, what, what are the things that we need to do to prepare for that and mitigate those kinds of hazards? Uh, so it will certainly help us to pave the way for humans. Um, and then, of course, just I already mentioned the fact that it is a decadal priority. The National Science, uh, the National Academies um, uh, prioritized this as uh, the report prioritized this as one of the highest priorities. And these return samples would be analyzed for many, many decades to come in laboratories across the world. The impact of that, you know, is, is going to be huge. There's going to be biologists, there's going to be geochemists, there's going to be modelers, theorists, all kinds of scientists that are currently maybe not even planetary scientists, but who will be interested in these samples, these samples that represent the very first samples from another planet that we will bring back here to study. Um, and then, of course, you can underestimate the, the inspiration and the impact of, of doing something really am ambitious, something really audacious, something that's really hard. This is going to be a hard, and I'm going to show you some of, the, some of the way that this architecture of this mission is structured right now. It is a very complicated mission. Um, it's going to be a hard thing. We've, some of the things we've never tried before, it's, there's going to be a number of firsts. And so it's not going to be simple. It's going to be hard. But you know that's where you make the biggest progress is when you really push the envelope. And, and, and it's going to be doing that in spades for sure. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, this is going to be our nearest term opportunity to answer the question, are we alone in the universe? And so I think that it's going to be super exciting to think about, you know, what we can achieve with this. And uh, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about how we're thinking about, about this. So the current, so <laughs> this is a really complicated plot. You, you, you can already see just from looking at it, right? You don't have to understand all of the intricacies of this, but essentially what you're seeing here in the, in the beige parts, that's the NASA portions of this architecture. In the blue portions, these are the ESA parts of the architecture. But what this is showing you is that this is a multi-spacecraft effort which is already already happening, actually. So in 2020, uh, the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover was launched, and it's already on Mars, and it's already collecting samples. So it was launched with something like uh, 43 sample tubes on board. And I'll show you a picture of those sample tubes in just a minute so you can see what they're like. But they're basically about the size of a piece of chalk. And there's 43 of them on board this rover. and the rover has already filled something like 26 of them. And so we're well on our way, we're more than halfway through in terms of collecting these samples. And uh, what's gonna happen in the future though, and this is, an, uh, this is a notional timeline at this point, and this, this is a program that's actually being, uh, is under review at the current time. Um, and so this might evolve to some degree, but this is the baseline plan at the current time. And so what's happening for the moment is that this part of the architecture, the Mars sample return architecture is already happening. Uh, basically the Perseverance rover is already documented and documenting and collecting rocks and regolith and atmosphere. And this next portion, the one that's outlined in green here, this is then the next phase of Mars sample return campaign, which is in NASA speak, it's called phase B, which is basically the technology development phase of a project. And so all of the technologies that are needed to make this happen, we're almost to a point where we're ready to, to just say, yes, go, we can go at this point because we've developed all of the technical capabilities that we need. And as I mentioned, there's a number of firsts involved here that we have to accomplish that we've never done before. And so, but the technologies now exist where we are ready to do that. And so we are currently in phase B, as, as I just mentioned, uh, there was an independent, what's called an independent review that happened just very recently, where they 
uh, looked at the architecture, they looked at the cost and the schedule, and they basically said, this is going to be much more ambitious and much, it's going to cost much more than what we currently think it's going to. And that's a real challenge because, you know, NASA, even though we think about NASA budget as being, and people imagine that the NASA budget is huge, but really it's a, an incredibly tiny little fraction of our national spending. It's basically something that's, you know, I think it's one penny on, on a basically uh, a budget that basically if you think about the, you know, the GDP as, as $100, it's something like a few pennies, basically. It, it's, it's, it's tiny. But uh, we have to fit the program in the context of all of the things that NASA does. And so to really make that happen, most, most likely how the, this thing is going to evolve is that we're gonna to have to possibly stretch this out further, mm -hmm. uh, which means that probably the earliest launches, which are shown here, there's gonna to have to be two more launches. One, that's basically an earth return orbiter. And this is the part that ESA is building. And that's gonna go into orbit around Mars. And then there's a NASA component that's a sample retrieval lander. So it's gonna be a lander that we think is actually gonna be probably the biggest lander that we've ever have landed on Mars. It's gonna land on Mars. It's gonna grab the samples that are being collected by Perseverance right now. Perseverance is actually going to deliver those to, to this lander. And then it's gonna launch the samples in a little basketball up into orbit around Mars which is then gonna be captured by this orbiter. And then that's gonna actually come back to earth and bring those samples back to earth. And so the current timeline is for the, the two launches, the earth return orbiter and the sample retrieval lander to happen in the 2027, 2028 timeframe. That's not very far away, <laughs> but as things stand, this is something that's being evaluated by NASA um, and a, a review team that's looking at this. And most likely it'll get pushed out by a couple of years. Um, and I think the final, pro the final um, architecture down select is gonna happen sometime within the next six months. So stay tuned. Uh, most likely the, the confirmation date for this program is gonna get pushed out to sometime in about a year or so. And so you'll be, again, hopefully you'll be hearing more about how, how this program evolves, but I'm gonna be telling you, what I'm gonna be telling you is the plan as it exists today. And most likely that is going to evolve to some degree. So just to kind of show you where, um, where the activities currently are happening that are relevant to Mars sample return, this is basically a map of Mars, uh, global map of Mars projected in this, in this fashion, where you can see some of the other uh, landers and, and, and uh, uh, a couple of the rovers that have already gone to Mars and the locations of some of the places uh, that have been considered for uh, the places where perseverance would potentially go to uh, perhaps, but basically the Viking landers, of course, in the 19, 1976, you know, that's where they landed. And then the very first rover, the Pathfinder Sojourner rover had landed in this region here. The Opportunity and Spirit are two other rovers that landed um, on, on Mars, um, uh, you know, in the, I guess it's been a, a long time now, almost uh, a couple of decades now, of, of, uh, or actually between a decade and a couple and, and two decades that these rovers were active. Um, and then, of course, uh, there's another rover currently, the Mars Science Laboratory, that's in Gale Crater, and that's an act that's still active. It's still actually doing science. And then the Perseverance rover landed in this region right here in what's called Jezero Crater. And the reason why this particular site was chosen for the Perseverance rover to collect samples there to bring back is because it represents an area that, so this is a crater and you can see the crater rim right here. And what you can see here is this kind of feature right here that looks like almost like a little meandering river coming into the crater. And you can see this kind of little delta right here that was deposited. So clearly there was, uh, and, and there's some evidence that maybe at the bottom of this crater, there was uh, an ancient lake that was a standing body of water. And so this was a place that was thought to be extremely promising to go back to, um, and it could record an ancient environment on Mars 
going dating back perhaps something like 4 billion years, 3.9 billion years, something like that, where there might have been an ancient lake, where there might have been some flowing, you know, riverine features that might have brought in, um, again, a source of water and, and had deposited sediments there that could have preserved evidence of ancient life. And so this was selected as the site to go because it was a very promising place to actually pick up exactly the right samples that we want to bring back to understand the kinds of things that I mentioned earlier. And so this is actually the perseverance, the the landing ellipse, I guess, of the, or actually the landing site as it was selected for the Perseverance rover. And this is just an expansion of that area. The Perseverance rover actually landed right in this location right here called the Octavia Butler landing site. And then the dashed line is the traverse that the rover took initially during its prime mission, which was two Mars years. Um, I'm sorry, one Mars year, and which is approximately two Earth years. Uh, so it landed um, uh, sometime in early 2021 and February of 2021, and basically completed its prime mission earlier this year. So it was basically, you know, two years of explore exploration that it did. And it went down here to the crater floor, explored some parts of this, and then went back and then up around here to the delta front. And is now, I'll show you a little bit uh, of where it is now. But this is basically the region that it explored. Here's just basically a schematic of the rover showing the, all the kinds of instruments that are currently on this rover that are basically helping us to characterize the context of what these samples are. What are they made of? What is their chemistry, mineralogy? Really understand very well, you know, what the context is before selecting the absolutely, you know, the right samples to bring back. And so um, what you're seeing here are a number of these um, instruments. The key one, of course, this is Mastcam Z, which is actually an instrument that's run by a faculty member in my school. His name is Jim Bell. And he and his team have been taking these beautiful images of the surface of Mars, but you might've seen some of these in the, in, the, in the news media, of course, but they're helping us to sort of select the places that we wanna to go to. And then there are a number of these other instruments um, like uh, Supercam and Sherlock and Pixel that are doing the characterization, the chemical characterization, the mineralogical characterization, the characterization possibly also of organic compounds. So the Sherlock instrument actually is, uh, is an instrument that actually can tell whether there might be some organic materials in the rocks as well. And so um, that's one of the ways that we're kind of characterizing uh, the samples. There's actually also a subsurface radar that can look subsurface and see what the, what the geology uh, underfoot is, is like. Uh, there's actually also a little uh, technology um, uh, uh, demonstrator on this thing uh, called MOXIE, which produces oxygen from CO2, which will again be data that'll be useful for when humans are getting ready to go explore Mars as well. And so this is the, this is the rover. And then the key part of this rover though, of course, and what distinguishes it from every other rover that's ever been on Mars is the sample um, acquisition or sample drilling system. And this one actually shows here a little bit better. Uh, these things are basically are abrading the surface of the rocks to remove any kind of weathering or coating that's on the rocks. And then this is a drill that basically then drills something like six or seven centimeters down below the surface and collects the rocks. And then it collects something that's again about the size of a piece of chalk. And that is collected, the sample is collected in a tube that looks like this. And the tube is then sealed in a, and it's really a, a very good tight seal because we wanna preserve these samples without any kind of contamination or messing them up in any way, because then they have to, we have to obviously bring them back and study them here on earth. And so um, those are sort of the main uh, components or parts of this rover. And this is you know, the, the most sophisticated analytical laboratory that's ever been sent on to another world, basically. So it's, a, it's an amazing piece of machinery. Um, and 
actually, if you go to the uh, Earth Sciences uh, Department here, I guess Rudolph Hall, there's a rover shown there. That's, I believe it's a Spirit or Opportunity rover, I think. And this, this, and that looks amazing, right? And it's an incredible laboratory, but this is even more sophisticated and, and probably about, it's about twice the size of that one. So a really big golf cart size thing. So this is basically then just a summary of kind of where the rover has been. Again, uh, we're looking at just one edge of Jezero crater here. So the whole crater would be probably, it's, it's way bigger than this room at this point, but you're just seeing the edge of the crater margin here. Uh, the landing site was somewhere over here for Perseverance rover, it went down here first and then went back around. This is the, again, the crater floor, then the Delta front, and then the delta fan is the, is the top region of the delta right here. There's another impact crater that's shown over here, but Perseverance basically, this whole distance, I mean, it's traversed something like 22 kilometers, which is incredible, incredible. It's like, you know, and it's moving really fast. It does autonomous navigation actually, and is able to actually um, cover a lot more ground than previous rovers have been able to do that. Um, I'm highlighting here this area here called Three Forks. Depot, and I'm, I'm gonna be showing you a little bit closer up image of the Three Forks Depot as well. But this is a place where we've already actually deposited a set of 10 samples. That's a contingency, as a contingency. Meaning that if something catastrophic was to happen to the rover tomorrow, there's already some samples on the ground in a safe place that we can go to and collect these samples. And so that was, but that's, those samples are not our first choice, by the way. So, I mean, that's a contingency sample. What we have on board Perseverance at the current time, those are the samples that we hopefully eventually want to go back and get, right? So, so far, what we've done is that we've basically got 14 samples and there's what we, what we call two witness tubes. So witness tubes, what Perseverance is carrying, I mentioned that Perseverance carried 43 tubes with it when it went. Of those 43 tubes, five of those tubes actually are what we call witness tubes. They've got some materials in them that when they're sort of exposed to the environment, they basically capture what's in the environment, the volatiles, possibly things like that. And they're basically telling us what was in the environment around the time when we're doing the sampling. And it gives us an idea of, you know, whether there might, you know, especially when we're looking for organics and we want the organic signature that we're measuring in the laboratories ultimately, we want to know whether it is Martian or whether maybe it's something that we carried with us here from Earth and are just sort of looking at it basically as a false positive. And so that those witness tubes help us to determine that. And so there's five of those. And so far on the rover itself, we've got 14 sample tubes that we've filled with samples. And we've got two of these witness tubes. Nine of other samples and one witness tube we've already laid down here in this area called Three Forks. And currently we have something like 15 sample tubes and two witness tubes that are still empty that we haven't sealed yet. And so we're already, as I said, more than halfway through collecting samples already. And what we actually did one more thing that I wanted to tell you about that was a strategy, that was a deliberate strategy that the, the rover employed during the prime mission, actually the team employed during the, <laughs> the prime mission was that for every rock that we collected a sample, we actually collected two samples at every rock. And so we collected, they had this kind of paired sampling strategy. And the reason why was that we wanted to have we wanted to lay down, of course, this contingency depot. So we would deposit basically one of the pair in that depot and the second pair would stay on board Perseverance. So the big strategy was to try to really maximize the diversity of samples that we were collecting. And so we wanted to make sure that we had on board Perseverance, all of the samples that represented the diversity of materials that we explored during the prime mission of Perseverance. And so we collected two of every rock and kept one on board and saved one to put down here. And so that was a strategy for the prime mission, but that prime mission ended earlier this year. And now Perseverance is in what we call an extended mission. And that is basically, you know, when the rover has done its, most of its job, everything is done, but we still, you know, it's got plenty of life in it still. 
there's still lots of really exciting things to do. And so now, you know, we're getting some additional science, we're collecting more samples, we're going to continue to add to the cache of samples that are on board the rover and continue to make it even better and better with increasing the diversity of rocks that we're collecting from regions that as we approach the margin, and I'll tell you a little bit about why we think there's actually really exciting stuff possibly even ahead of us that we want to collect. The idea is to get again, the diversity of samples that's gonna tell us, that's gonna be helping us to address all of the science goals that I mentioned, to understand the geologic context, to understand the climate history, to understand the history of you know, whether there was ancient life, to answer that question, whether there was ancient life. Those three big tenets we wanna be able to answer with the diversity of samples. And with the diversity of samples, particularly what's important is the diversity of potentially habitable environments the diversity of, of, of places where we might have found liquid water. So lake sediments, riverine sediments, maybe hydrothermal deposits, maybe even just kinds of you know, fluids that were flowing through the crust and altering the rocks. I mean, the, any kinds of different environments that we can find where there might have been liquid water um, that could preserve evidence of ancient life. So we, we're trying to maximize diversity and that's been one of the key things that we've been, that's been one of the key uh, sort of driving um, strategies for where and how we sample things on, on Mars. So this is basically just, uh, it's, it's, it's a complicated looking sort of figure right here, but what I wanna, what, what I want you to get from this is Again, the diversity of samples that we've already collected on Mars, just by looking at all of these pictures, you can tell, you know, we're looking at rocks here and they're all, they all look kind of different. Some of them are these like these very, very fine grained sediments. And by the way, just to sort of explain a little bit of what you're looking at here, uh, down here, of course, is the map and the traverse and the red dots are the locations of where each of these samples has been collected. And each of these little horizontal strips that you see here made up of three or two panels, this is basically sampling a single rock. So each of these sort of strips of two or three represent a, a distinct rock that was sampled. The one panel on the extreme left-hand side of each of these strips that's outlined in red, that's basically what we call an abrasion patch. So that was one of the, the drill bits, not the drill bit, but actually an abrasion tool that abrades a little patch of the rock that's maybe about five um, or so uh, centimeters across. So you're looking at something that's about yay big. And that basically, it abrades a patch and you can actually visually see what the rock looks like on the interior. And you can see for some of them, like I mentioned, very, very fine grained sedimentary rock. Uh, here is actually, uh, and what we call an igneous rock. And I'll show you some images that you can see actually the crystal structure that tells you that the, it, this actually solidified from a magma that, that was basically a, a, a came from the interior of Mars. Um, and so what you're looking at here on the sort of, that's the sort of the, the, the leftmost panel is the abrasion patch. So just to look at the texture, the next panels that you see, the one or two next panels those are the tops of the cores that were actually taken. And they're about, maybe about a centimeter across. So this is about a centimeter across, looking down at the top of the tube after the sample was taken. And you can again see what the rock, the top of the rock looks like. This one over here, that's actually a regolith, bit of regolith. And so you can see what the regolith looks like um, on the surface of Mars. It's again, a few centimeters across. And here's the top of the tube, sample tube, looking down at the regolith. And you can see big clasts, rocklets that are sitting there and some fine grained dust and stuff that's in there. So this is actually uh, basically the equivalent of soil here on the earth, but it's, it's called regolith because, you know, again, we don't wanna make any kind of implications about organic materials or soils as we think of them here on earth, but that's what that is. But then all of these other things are rock things this one is kind of unusual because this is actually the very first time we tried to sample uh, a rock on the surface of Mars once we got there. And it was a very, very altered, very weathered rock, which basically fell apart when we sampled it. And we'd actually uh, started to 
well, we, we initially started out doing the whole sampling process completely autonomously, um, such that, you know, basically the pictures were taken, the sealed tube was sealed. And when the images came back, we looked in the tube and basically there's nothing there. And so it was, but, you know, we make lemonade out of, out of lemons here because we, this is actually a sample of the Mars atmosphere. It's a serendipitous sample of the Mars atmosphere. We'll be able to get some really fantastic data just by studying the Martian atmosphere, the gas that's, that's basically sealed inside this tube. And so, but what we learned then of course, is that every time we are doing the sampling process, we have to take the picture and look down into the tube, see if it's filled. And only then after we do that, then we seal the tube after that. So we've been doing that ever since. Um, so that's basically all of the samples that have been collected within uh, Jezero Crater, mostly during the prime mission. And these are all of the sort of the three witness tubes, one atmosphere, two regolith samples, and 15 rock cores. Uh, seven of them are paired, and there's a single one right here. And they're igneous rocks, meaning that they crystallized from a magma, and also sedimentary rocks, meaning that they were deposited from water, some kind of liquid water. And so the Green ones that I've outlined here, these are ones that we put down in this Three Forks Depot that I mentioned earlier. And in fact, here's a picture of all of the 10 tubes that we deposited in this region called Three Forks. And you can see that it's an incredible, it's like a billiards table, basically. It's completely flat, very benign. It's a place where you can land or, you know, land or very, very safely. And so this is the place that we chose to put the three forks, um, the 10 sample tubes uh, that are part of the three forks depot. And um, you know, the science, there was this workshop, a science community workshop where they, they assessed the quality of these samples and basically said that these samples were worthy of being returned as a contingency sample in case there was a problem. This next, next set of sort of, as we went past the prime mission, once the prime mission was over, we actually were able to get up onto the delta and onto the fan. And basically the ones that I'm high, sort of uh, outlined in green, uh, they're actually samples that I showed in the previous uh, image as well. And they were collected in the delta front. But on the delta fan, uh, there are three samples that were collected here. And all of these are some kind of basically sedimentary type uh, rock deposited by some kind of either water activity. Uh, one of them is a conglomerate, I believe, um, which is basically a collection of diverse, all different kinds of rocks um, mixed into one rock. Um, and so again, a very different set of samples on the Delta fan. Um, and then where we are currently is very close to the margin of the Jezero crater and we've collected two samples here near the margin. And the reason why closer to the margin, it's really kind of exciting is because we have data from orbiting spacecraft looking down at this area. And this is the area where we've seen the strongest evidence for the most amount of a mineral called carbonate. And carbonate on earth is one that is deposited in usually in sort of deeper water. And so, you know, basically it's, it's um, it's, a, it's an indicator that there was a lot of kind of water activity in this particular region. And so we wanted to sample, sample here and, it's, and, it, and actually the rocks, and I'll show you some close-ups. These rocks are really, really pretty exciting. So I'm gonna show you very quickly, go through, walk you through some of the different, and I'm not gonna show you every single picture of every single rock. I could do that as a geologist. I'm excited enough about it that I could tell you that. But hopefully what you'll get from this is again, you know, how beautiful some of these rocks are and how exciting and the kinds of information that are preserved in these amazing rocks. And actually the wonderful thing is that, you know, we had expected when we went to the floor of Jezero Crater where we landed there, we had expected to see lake sediments down at the bottom, but it was a total surprise to us. What we found is rocks like this, which are actually igneous rocks. And we know they're igneous rocks because some of the instrument data that came back, this is actually a pixel image. That's one of the instruments that takes images of the minerals that are in the abrasion patch. And you can see the different colors that you see here. Those are different minerals that are, and you can look at the textures 
And you see a very kind of characteristic interlocking texture, which is very characteristic of what we call igneous rocks, which are basically crystalline rocks that are formed by solidification of magma. So by looking at the chemistry, by looking at the texture, we can tell that this is actually an igneous rock. And actually, some people might be saying, you know, they might be disappointed, hey, it's not a lake sediment, an igneous rock, why is that important? I'm actually really excited about this one because it can help you. These are the kinds of rocks that you can actually date very precisely in laboratories using techniques like uranium lead dating and other kinds of dating techniques. And you can learn something about the time scales of when things were happening on Mars by looking at these kinds of rocks. And so we hadn't expected to find this, but we found it. And I think that that's actually really fantastic. Um, here's another type of igneous rock that we found on the crater floor. It's made actually mostly of a mineral called olivine. Uh, olivine is a, is a gemstone actually, peridote. It's sort of a green mineral. Um, and it's also actually formed uh, as a result of solidification of uh, a magma. And usually, actually, here's another sort of pixel image that you see of these kinds of interlocking textures you, one of the minerals is actually completely enclosing another mineral right here. There's actually tiny little melt, what we call melt inclusions, which are trapping some of the liquid magma composition. It's glassy at this point, we think. Some of these inclusions most likely are glassy. But when we look at the compositions of those, they'll tell us something about the, what the composition of the magmas were from which these rocks were forming. And so there's a lot of really, really exciting things to be learned from these rocks. Those are the igneous rocks, but I'll show you some of the sedimentary rocks which were deposited from liquid water. And many of them are, are uh, you know, they, they're actually, the exciting thing is that there's a diversity of sedimentary rocks that we find. There's, they're not all the same kind of sedimentary rocks, meaning that they're formed in different kinds of water-rich environments, either whether they're energetic environments or whether they're quiescent environments, you know, more like the bottom of a lake or more like from a really fast moving river, they're basically forming in very different environments. Here's one that's actually got, that's basically a, a medium to fine grained sandstone with lots of little clasts or little rocklets that are in there. And so this one we think is likely, you know, basically more of a high energy environment that it was forming in, or it had liquid water, but probably flowing liquid water perhaps, that was bringing in rocks of all different kinds from the source headwaters. Um, and then here's another one that's very much, you can see that the texture is very much more fine grained. And by the way, these pictures that I'm showing on the left-hand side, you can see where every rock that we sampled, we had a little abrasion patch that we made first, to, as I mentioned, to look at the texture of the rock. And then right next to each, to that, we collected two different cores and the holes that you see are the cores that were made and where we collected two each of each of these samples. So this fine grained rock is really exciting because it's actually, it's, it's basically like a mudstone or siltstone here on the earth and has actually showing a very strong signal that could be indicative of high organic content. So this could be a very, you know, it could be a fantastic rock to look for evidence of ancient ancient life on Mars, actually. So it has what we call a high, high potential for preserved biosignatures, meaning that there might be organic compounds in there that could tell us something about uh, the possibility of ancient life on, on Mars. Um, here's a, a little video that shows how the regolith was collected. So this was almost like a little sand dune uh, near the Delta front where the rover basically collected some of the uh, the little dusty portions. Um, there's also some rocklets that you can see in here. So this is a mixture of all different kinds of materials, uh, basically could preserve a sort of diversity of rock types that might be uh, originating. The source rocks might be coming from within Jezero Crater, maybe even from beyond Jezero Crater. And so it'll give us an idea of what the kind of diversity of rock types are in this general region. And there's also the fine grained kind of globally averaged Mars dust in here from which we can learn a lot about, again, the question of you know, hazardous materials that could affect uh, how human beings are going to operate and, and be safe when they're, when they're on Mars. And so we'll learn a lot about, about that when we study materials like this. 
Um, beyond uh, sort of the prime mission, I mentioned also that once we got, got up kind of in the Delta fan region, uh, we had sort of more sedimentary materials. Here's a, a medium grain sedimentary rock, a sandstone that's got a lot of, again, the mineral called carbonate, which is deposited again um, in an aqueous environment. Um, could be also, you know, recording a, a different, different habitable environment than what was recorded in the sort of Delta front region. Um, and then here's another sample. This one is actually, it's almost like when you look at it, it almost looks like a little jewelry box filled with all different little rocklets. Uh, it's, a, it's a conglomerate, meaning that it, the, it's made up of all different kind of mixture of rock types uh, coming from uh, basically the general region of Jezero Crater. Uh, and then of course, carried along by water and deposited in a single place and then creating a little, little rock that's basically a melange of all these different rock types. Um, what's really kind of exciting that this is the, the last up close and personal rock that I'm gonna show you, but this one, this one is possibly the most exciting one rock that we've collected so far, perhaps. And the reason why, and this is being collected near the rim, the margin of this Jezero crater. This is a place where we think from orbit, we're seeing the carbonate signature where this very abundant carbonates. And in fact, the sedimentary rock, it has hydrated carbonates, meaning that we can actually sig see a signal of actually some water being present that's locked in the structure of these carbonates. So ancient Mars water that's actually locked in the structure of these minerals. There's also hydrated silica. And these are both phases that could be good preservation environments for maybe ancient fossils, perhaps, microfossils. I don't know. I mean, we'll have to look at these rocks up close and personal to really be able to tell. But this is a really, really exciting, you know, exciting rock to be able to bring back sometime in the future. So what are the kinds of science that we hope to do when we bring back these samples? And so going back to the basalt that I showed you before, you know, when we have these kinds of igneous minerals, these interlocking uh, minerals like pyroxene and plagioclase, you can actually pull them apart and you can do geochronology. You can date the formation of these rocks. You can learn something about the composition of the magma from which this rock formed. And that in fact also tells us about the interior composition of Mars. What is the mantle composition? What is the interior composition of Mars? Um, that we can also do paleomagnetic studies on these types of materials. And that could tell us something about whether Mars had an ancient magnetic field. And magnetic field, of course, I mean, we think that Mars probably did have a magnetic field in the ancient past. It does not now. But that kind of magnetic field is, is important because it sort of shields, if, if there is going to be biology on the surface, then it can actually shield the surface from um, harmful uh, you know, basically radiation by, by, by solar wind that can actually really affect life negatively. And so um, we learn about those kinds of things. There's also salts in here that, that can tell us something about the composition of water that was maybe altering these rocks. Um, and then of course, from the sedimentary types of rocks like the mudstone, siltstone that I just showed you here are sort of a very sort of high uh, resolution images. Here's a one micro, one millimeter sort of scale bar just for scale. But you can actually see that there are multiple generations of um, basically salts that are sulfates, like, things like that, that were deposited by different generations of fluid flowing through this rock. And so we can actually date some of that material, learn when that water was flowing through this rock, um, it might also, the salts might also have preserved, again, some evidence of ancient life as well. And so the, the ones, the rocks particularly deposited that are water lane uh, rocks can tell us particularly about um, ancient biology, perhaps on Mars. So in, in summary, you know, we found a diversity of rock types. Uh, and the diversity, in fact, is far better than what we even had reason to expect before we got there. And we've also recorded multiple different kinds of potential habitable environments. There might be lake sediments in there. There might be sediments that were deposited by, by rivers. There might be potentially uh, some, some of the kind of uh, 
maybe subsurface, near surface, subsurface water flowing through some of the igneous rocks that could have deposited some salts as well that are preserving different types of habitable environments. Um, there might be some organics in some of these rocks. There's some evidence from some of the instruments that is suggest suggestive that there might be organics. And then of course, um, we will learn information that'll be useful for humans going, going to these places. And so, you know, what's ahead for perseverance? We've collected, you know, we've collected more than half the tubes now. We've sealed more than half the tubes. Um, what we're seeing here, this is, this is a view from, from perseverance, very close to where it is right now, looking out towards the rim, towards the crater rim. And up ahead, you know, we, we likely are going to see maybe some melt rocks created by the impact that made Jezero Crater. So we'll know exactly when this crater perhaps was formed. Uh, there might be some hydrothermal systems that we might see. These hydrothermal systems on Earth, you know, these are found in the kind of deep sea kind of environments. And they actually have a huge amount of biodiversity actually associated with them. And so there might be some hydrothermal systems that potentially could be recording, again, another habitable environment on Mars that we might see. Uh, we'll probably see some very ancient rocks just beyond Jezero Crater as well. And that'll tell us something about the ancient history, the geologic history of Mars as well. So there's still really some fantastic rocks up ahead that we might be uh, excited to see. And what I'm gonna end is, end with is a, a little uh, animation that shows uh, how the Mars sample return uh, project is going to be bringing back the samples to Earth that are currently being collected by Perseverance. So here's the sample retrieval lander heading to Mars. Perseverance is collecting this last sample, which hopefully has not been right as the lander is getting there. Rover is going to be the final arm on the lander that's going to grab the sample tubes, this little canister. That would be bad, I think, in the early 2030s. So that's the plan. <laughs> well, thank you, Professor Wadba. Okay, we have time for some questions. And um, if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. I see a couple of hands already. We'll start here. That's the advantage of sitting in front. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You've got the core. Yes. And it's like a piece of chalk. Yep. How do you break it off from deeper in the rock to put it in the tube? Yes. So you, the drill actually has the tube inside of it. And it actually, as it's drilling it, basically the rock core is, is put inside the tube. Okay. And then there's a little twist, basically, that breaks off the rock core from the bottom, basically. So it actually, there's a little force that's applied and it actually breaks off the, the sample. And then it's sealed.
I, the, the 10 samples that you left on the planet, yes. they appear just to be sitting out in the open. Are they, how are they protected from the weather? <laughs> they, are not, weather? they are not protected from the weather. Um, they are actually, so you saw that the sample tube I, that I just showed you, it's painted white. So it's painted white for the reason that you don't want it to be, to get super hot, you know, so it, it's actually, painted with coated with the white paint so that the samples that are sitting on the surface don't get super warm. Um, other than that, the tubes are completely hermetically sealed. And we've actually, you know, one of my, one of my uh, postdoctoral researchers who work in, who's working with me at JPL, they've been doing some measurements of the, how tight these seals are and they are incredibly tight actually. And so we've been, we actually just, we we're gonna be publishing the results very soon for that but they're going to be sitting out there. People have asked, you know, about whether are they going to be covered with dust or what, all of that. I think, you know, the, the dust storms do happen, but the deposition rate of the dust is incredibly, incredibly small. And so we don't expect any more than maybe, you know, a millimeter or so of, of dust on them after about 10 years or something like that. And some of the dust, will, of course, gets moved around as well. The really the finest grain fraction does. Uh, we've seen that on other rovers where, you know, you get a layer of dust on them and another dust stone comes by and then they get cleaned up. So, yeah. So, yeah. So I'm curious, as the number of empty sample containers dwindles, how does the decision-making change? Because I could imagine kind of like a decision paralysis if you only have like five left. Do you skip things that look too similar? Is yeah. It, it, yeah, so the decision process for that, I mean, so the science team, the Mars 2020 science team makes the decisions on a, on a sort of regular ongoing basis, reevaluates things. They sometimes have to make decisions on the fly about, at some point they were actually trying to decide whether maybe the sample that they had may not be the best one. So could they dump it out and then maybe get another one that might be better? So there actually, there is some amount of flexibility in what we can do. Uh, there is a group of scientists that were selected to be part of the 2020 team that's called, they're called the Return Sample Science uh, Group. And they are specifically tasked with actively sort of assessing, you know, what are the best samples to get? How do we sort of maximize the science potential of the samples that we bring back? But it's, it's not something that's sort of set in stone. It's sort of an ongoing discussion. And actually, you know, we've got people here that are actively participating in those kinds of discussions and, and can probably, you know, tell us a lot more about how, what goes on there. But uh, yeah, I participate in some of the return sample science um, discussions and yeah, it's an ongoing, and sometimes it's a hard decision, you know, we don't really know what the best thing might be, but, you know, many minds put together and get all of the data that we have from the wonderful instruments that we have, and then try to apply that to maximizing the science potential. Thanks. Are there plans to collect samples following, I'm over here, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Are there plans to collect samples following a um, specific storm event um, from any particular region? So if you know that there has been a recent storm, um, would there be plans to go back in, you know, during a safe period to collect samples to see how that activity has weathered regolith in that area? Mm, so, the dust storms are actually, um, they're mobilizing some of this kind of what we call globally averaged dust. I mean, so this is the most fine grained fraction of dust that we think is actually pretty well mixed even on a global scale. And so I don't think that we expect to see huge changes necessarily in the composition of, the, of that material. What we did want to do was to actually sample that material and, and bring it back to really understand, you know, whether it represents potential, you know, hazard for, for humans to breathe, if there's something in there that could be hazardous. And we'll learn something about the diversity of actually 
you know, the kinds of rocks that are sort of in the area and the global compositions as well, more broadly from this most fine grained fractions. So there's a lot of interesting science that we learned from at least getting one of those samples back, but I don't think that there's really, but you know, there's, there's not gonna be anything substantially, um, I think uh, sort of, uh, that, that's gonna tell something new if we sample right after a dust storm necessarily. How has it been determined that uh, greater than 50% of the Mars surface is more than uh, 3 billion years old? Yes, yeah, so you know it's a good question. What what we have currently, the information that we have, comes from extrapolating what we know about the surface of the moon. Actually, um, we have been to the moon. We've collected rocks from the moon, and we know that we can actually get relative ages of surfaces on the moon from the abundance of just you know how many craters have you see on the surface of the moon. So the more ancient areas are ones that are more affected by impacts and craters. They've had a longer exposure to things coming in and hitting the surface and making craters on them. Um, and so we have calibrated the sort of the crater counting technique of dating surfaces using sort of lunar samples as a guide. Now, the flux of material that's falling on the moon and, and basically, uh, causing these craters is not necessarily the same as on Mars, but that's all that we have at the current time. And that's part of the reason actually why we want to bring back samples of igneous rocks that have, that come from terrains where we can count the craters and then actually calibrate that kind of crater counting technology for, or crater counting capability for dating surfaces for Mars, specifically Mars. But with the best knowledge that we have at the current time, we can tell that there are, you know, terrains on Mars that are extremely ancient and most likely date back to older than, you know, three or three and a half billion years ago. So that's the best that we can do at least at the current time. My question is, um, what happens if, the, if there's a powerful enough dust storm that would carry away the samples that are like just in reserve? What would, and, uh, and also the, rovers like down what, what like what would we do yeah then? You, you know what i mean you, you've probably seen the movie the martian right have you seen that movie nope. no <laughs> <laughs> how, how many here have seen the martian by the way oh yeah a lot of them yeah you see you see the opening sequence where there's this huge dust storm that's going on and it's just like oh my god this is that's actually that's that's total fabrication. I mean, it's not the dust storms. I mean, they move the fine global dust around, but the Martian atmosphere is like a hundred times thinner than the Earth atmosphere. There's not a whole lot. Of, there's, it's not gonna. It's not gonna blow those tubes away. They're, it's, they're, the tubes are not going anywhere. They're gonna stay where they are. <laughs> <laughs> then what will you do? Well, I mean. Yeah, we know that based on all of the information that we have, and we actually, um, you know, have orbital assets, of course, uh, we can tell what's going on on the surface of Mars, we know where the dust storms are happening, and Perseverance is monitoring, of course, the area around it as well. We'll know if something really bad happens, but, um, you know, at the current time, all the information that we have it basically says that the dust storms really don't, are not gonna do anything to the tubes. Well, what happens if it does? <laughs> you know what, we're not actually, that's our contingency sample. We're not actually gonna go get those, those samples if we can help it. I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna have Perseverance deliver the sample tubes to the lander. That's our primary plan. Hi, um, what um, is gonna, oh, I'm sorry. Is it my turn or not? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, I had two questions. They're kind of related to the return of the samples. Um, I know a young engineer that has worked on, on this project a little bit, and I thought that the return was going to involve some sort of catapulting with the, um, with the robotic arm to get this thing off the ground, which I thought sounded pretty weird, but I didn't really see that in the animation. Maybe I missed it. And then the other thing was that intrigued me was you said that... Um, that there would be no parachute. And I'm just wondering what the reason for that would be. Start playing that just because. Catapult is actually 
air launch, you're going to launch the rocket by actually tossing it in the air first before you launch it. Would you like the rocket? You don't want that rocket coming. Yes. Avoid something like what happened to the Genesis what might have happened. Um, there's actually a spacecraft that was orbiting Mars called MAVEN, which actually made some measurements of atmospheric loss processes on Mars. And, you know, it looks like somehow you know, we have been actually losing, the Martian atmosphere has been sort of losing its kind of uh, thickness or the comp basically molecules have been escaping from the top of the atmosphere. Um, and that some, you know, that in the past that might have been a much thicker atmosphere. And so it, 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 there's some thoughts about whether maybe that was a catastrophic process. Maybe there was an impact involved that actually helped to make that, maybe it was a faster rate in the past. Um, but when we go back and actually study in detail some of the ancient materials that we bring back, and also, you know, the, some of the salts that we see deposited, they might not be quite so ancient, actually. They're, they're probably a little bit more recent than some of the other materials that are in there. So we'll have a diversity of ages potentially represented among the uh, materials that were deposited by different, different kind of stages of, of water um, activity on the surface of Mars. And so when we bring back those samples, we'll actually be able to tease apart a lot of information about May, but perhaps different times in Mars history when these materials were being deposited. And so I think we'll be able to learn. I mean, I, and I'm sure there's going to be some huge surprises, but you know, we can learn an incredible amount from bringing back these materials to Earth just with the kinds of tools that we have available here and state-of-the-art technologies and capabilities that we have here. So I'm very confident that you know, we'll learn a lot and we'll be able to pull apart a lot of information there. And we could, I mean, if we, if we do find evidence of life, that's going to be amazing. But if we don't, I mean, that's not a fail either, because that's going to tell us something really important too, that even though there was these kind of habitable, habitable environments, if there was, if the life did not originate, you know, why did it not originate? But we'll learn some clues to that from looking at the chemistry of these rocks. So either way. Um, in 10 years time, when the samples return to earth, I know there will be lots of scientists who um, will have a lot of work and want to look at them all. But I was wondering if there were any plans for having any samples available for the public to see, maybe in museums or ex exhibitions or any PR for the regular folk. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, part of this bringing back these samples is to get people excited about, you know, what what science can enable and get kids excited about about science. So I'm I'm sure that I mean so the details of the exact plans of what's going to happen with the samples, those are actually being developed right now. Uh, so I can't tell you that, yeah, you know, there's going to be a little piece that's going to go and sit in the Smithsonian Museum. I'm sure there will be, but <laughs> but uh, you know, 
those plans are going to be developed as we get closer to when we get the samples back. But I am I'm quite sure that we will have exhibits and opportunities for the public to really be able to see some of some of these amazing materials. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> what got you excited about science in the first place when you're young? Yeah, gosh, you know, I grew up in the foothills of the Himalayas and just those incredible, you know, and I loved being outdoors, doing outdoors things. I was, you know, I just, I just loved collecting little different looking rocks, you know, and it was just, uh, I think it was just, you know, I was fascinated by, you know, how do you get these huge mountain ranges, you know, how do you form them? And I, you know, I was fascinated by that. And so I, I studied geology because it allowed me to do field work outside and, you know, trying to understand something about the natural world while applying the principles of physics and chemistry, which I really liked actually, which I, I enjoyed studying those, but it was a real application of, of sort of understanding a natural world, applying those sciences. And so I, I, was, I was excited to do that from, you know, I, I always loved, loved science as a kid. Um, and my parents were hugely influential as well. I mean, they always encouraged my sister and I to kind of, they basically said, you know, they, be curious about things and, you know, ask lots of questions. And they, they were, I would say, you know, very influential in my career path. Yes, thank you so much for the amazing talk. So my question is, do we know the crater is a result of a volcanic activity or is it actually no, a impact, impact from it? No, yeah. So that was my question that in that case, if actually these rocks actually something that came outside Mars yes, and how representative is the samples of the whole Mars? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, the, you know, the energy of that impact, it's, it's such a huge impact crater. The energy of that impact probably vaporized the impactor to a large extent. And so there's not, there's probably not a whole lot of the impactor surviving still, uh, but the impact is there. And we, we, you know, we know from having studied the moon, you know, there's a lot of impact craters on the moon. And, uh, you know, Brad, of course, is, 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 a, is a huge expert in, in lunar studies and impact studies there. But those, those large impacts, I mean, you know, they basically, you vaporize the impactor almost completely. And so what you, what's left behind, though, is the, is the feature that's in the planet that you can sort of see the, some parts of the interior of the planet that were deeper down that are exhumed as a result of the impact itself. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's going to be some interesting features that we'll encounter as a result of that impact. The impact melts that we find, the rocks that will help us to date the time of that crater. Uh, there might be some possible hydrothermal uh, deposits associated with some of the fracturing that happened as a result of that impact. Um, and so, yeah, it'll be, there'll, be some, there'll be some rock remnants from that event. Talking about that's it. Yeah. Uh, let's thank Professor Buckle once again. When you came in, if you did not fill out one of the little slips of paper that tells us how you knew about the lecture, we'd like you to do that if you would, please. Um, and also, I think there might be some Mars bars. So thank you again for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs>